downtown parking spaces today. Uh, a miracle, hey, but a miracle found one today. I don't know why they're painting that bridge up there. That's interesting. Maybe. <laughs> Those of you who are logging on at home, welcome. It is 11-11 on the first Sunday of April in the year of our Lord, 2024. Glad that you're all here. Even Dr. Sheila came by herself. I said, you came by yourself and found a parking space? She said, I was afraid I was going to lose my status from last week. <laughs> I said, well, I like to keep everybody on edge. <laughs> Don't ever get too comfortable. <laughs> so, birds doing okay? They're still with us? Okay. Good. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad you guys came back. The, the little ladies did really good last week, so uh, they're pros. Um, Spirit of God, we're always in your presence. Where can we go from your presence? But on days like today, something else happens. The synergy, the people are one, and nothing they imagine to do shall be impossible to them. Something happens where two or more are gathered together in the Christ. And we believe that today... We say some things that will move history in a better direction. and The kingdom will not just be at hand. It will be revealed in our hearts. And uh, that when we leave here in a little while, we'll all know that it was absolutely worthwhile to be here. And uh, we speak a blessing over this place in your name. Amen. Before you're seated, I also want to say I'm glad to have Kevin. Since you all saw Kevin, usually you don't see him because he gigs late on Saturday night, but... Kevin has had open heart surgery since we saw him last, and it was, I won't give you all the details, it was quite the journey, and I had lunch with him about a week ago, I said, I got to tell you, I'm props to you for good attitude, because Piedmont was so backed up, they, he waited in there for, de- the, the whole thing took nearly a month of him waiting there, and there were people in front of him, and then so many people they actually had to send him home and come back, and he's, he, he kept the, the best attitude I've ever seen because he said, you know, I just have to believe something better is working out and maybe saving my life. So he's really a walking miracle, and we're um, kudos to him. And uh, not that I, not that I think I'm going to have to do it, but I, I, you know, I had a cardiologist this um, meeting this week, and you know, it wasn't everything I hoped to hear. And I got to go in for a CAT scan, and, and you know, you have to believe for the best or prepare for the worst. And when I think about people who've just been through it, I think, well, if it comes to that, I will go through that. You know, I mean, we we believe God will deliver us from this fiery furnace, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow to Nebuchadnezzar. And so it's good to it's it's good to see other people who have already been through something that you may or may not have to go through yourself and and you know, not fear it. You know, that's that's Yeah. Oh, and uh, yeah, the other thing is there was an issue with his valve that he didn't know about that if there hadn't something if there hadn't been the delay it he probably wouldn't be with us today so i'm telling you all things work together for good even the things that are painful and obnoxious and frustrating like all of it worked not just the good part all of it works together so if you visualize something and it manifests that's great if it doesn't you have to believe well, there's more going on here than I'm aware of, and uh, he's going to do exceedingly good abundantly above all I can ask or think. So uh, we're full of miracles today, and uh, I, I probably I could. Rhonda just told me that um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but just, um, amazing miracles she had where she had a flat tire and just happened there was a cop behind her who, he didn't sound like a cop to me, he sounds like an angel. Like he fixed the flat, he found out her. Her uh, spare was flat. He stopped traffic. He escorted her. I mean, it was like he did everything to give her the key to the city. And, uh, and so that was cool. It was, uh, it, that, it's lo- lots of praise reports here today. So uh, when we come together, like bring all that gratitude in here. You know, uh, remember, I'll never forget reading those gratitude lists on that beach. And seeing that double rainbow pop up. I mean, you can tell me, ah, it's just a rainbow. They happen all the time with St. Simon's. I'm like, I don't know. It hadn't rained at all that day. And it, it happened right where we were doing the gratitude list. I'm, 
I'm going to say it was the energy of all that gratitude. So anybody else got gratitude today? Anybody else got miracles you've had this week? You had one? Yeah. Yeah. Conyers had a tornado. That's Philip was saying it just passed right over their house. So that's good. Praise the Lord. Uh, yeah, that could have been a totally different story today. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, we got a lot, lot to be grateful for today. Um, let's just let's just lift our hands up and just express gratitude. Spirit of God, we we uh, express gratitude to that higher power, that that uh, divine presence, that intelligent design, that God that we worship. Uh, thank you, thank you for your deliverance and for working all things together for our good. We thank you for it. We bless you for it. Amen. All right, please remain standing for the Lord's Prayer, if you will. Oh, that's pretty. Our Father, who art in heaven, presence of divine love and light that lives within us and within all of life, hallowed be thy name. We invoke the powerful, creative nature of all that is sacred and holy. Thy kingdom come. We embrace the healing essence that is the kingdom of heaven within us. Thy will be done. We accept our greatest good as we align with our divine nature. On earth as it is in heaven, knowing that the affairs of our lives reflect our evolving consciousness. Give us this day our daily bread. Each day we receive great blessings from within and throughout all the activities of our lives. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We accept the divine nature of all things and all people including ourselves, as we move away from judgment and toward greater awareness of divine presence. And lead us not into temptation. We shall be vigilant in expressing and experiencing the oneness with all life. But deliver us from evil, as we are learning to live without fault-finding and suffering. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, For we accept the consciousness of divine perfection with all its power and glory right here, right now, and forever. Amen. And so it is. Tell the person next to you there's nobody I'd rather sit next to today than you. And then you may be seated. Y'all come on in. You may be seated. Again. Um, thank you for being here today, and um, those of you who uh, uh, sent me something for my birthday, I appreciate it so much. Thank you. And uh, we're still, Danny Gloria gave me a card this morning, so the waters are still troubled. That means like the, bir- the, the birthday, is, we're still in birthday zone, so uh, you don't have to say, well, I'll get him next year. No, you can still get me this year. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's right, all, all month. Um, but before I tell you what our, uh, well, let, let, me, let, me, let me talk about the meditation weekend first. We got meditation weekend number 22 coming up April 27th and 28th. What is that, three weeks from today? And, uh, or four weeks from today? None of us can count, apparently. <laughs> How many, is that right? Yeah, three weeks from today. There's only four Sundays in April, so if you're, if you, um, well, there were five in March, so uh, if you, which by the way, just, nobody chose, nobody in the White House chose Easter as Trans Awareness Day. For all the people that were yelling about that, Trans Awareness Day or Visibility Day is always March 31st. Easter fluctuates, so it just happened that, and, oh, and Tomorrow, there's just going to be eclipse. It's not the rapture, I promise. So, just, I want to, and the earth is round. So, let, let me get all that straight now. Anyway, uh, if you don't go to St. Simon's, don't come here on the 27th, 28th. This will be, because we'll be down there. This will be our sixth time going to uh, that very special place. And there's always a, an amazing synergy. It's worth going to St. Simon's just to go. Uh, but when we, bring our energy down there something always unprecedented and wonderful happens and um uh we're, we're at, i'm this month i'm going to be teaching on meditation i like to on the months when we're doing a weekend i like to i don't always do it but i like to teach on it and 
So I'm going to save it for the end of what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to meditate some. Uh, before I show you our outreach for this month, full disclosure, last month we gave to Save the Children, and I kept saying it was the Atlanta chapter. Apparently there isn't an Atlanta chapter. When I was uh, uh, searching it, I came across the Georgia chapter, and that's what I was thinking. So Avery wrote me, she said, I've been waiting till the end of the month to send a check, but I cannot find an Atlanta chapter, uh, and, and I, that was right about the time I was like in the middle of a cardiologist thing, and I was yelling at the, the nurse, and I got to break this stronghold I have with nurses, because I had a really bad one right about the time you texted me. Uh, it was really bad. Uh, I thought they were going to remove me from the premises, but, um, uh, huh? <laughs> No, it was just her, her interrogation uh, was just a little, she, she didn't have good bedside manner. Let's just say that. Anyway, she texts me, hey, come in. She said, I cannot, I've searched everywhere. I cannot find this Atlanta chapter you're talking about. I said, we'll send it to the international. So we have given to save the children. I just, just in case you were wondering, like, there's no Atlanta chapter. Well, apparently Atlanta benefits from the umbrella. So. The money has gone. To, we've saved some somewhere. We, I was thinking they were in Atlanta, but they they might have been in Lithuania. I'm not sure, but somebody got saved. Uh, so along those lines, this month we're giving to UNICEF again, and uh, uh, UNICEF is all over the world, and so that's going to be our out, outreach. I love those uh, uh, children's charities and uh, those global ones. So. Um, that's where you're giving the trickle-down effect. We'll get uh, into those, into that place as well, okay? Um, I'm going to go ahead and get, like I said, I'm going to do a, if I don't talk too long, I'm going to do a meditation at the end. So I think we'll just go ahead and jump into this series because that's, um, I think what I'm going to say to you today is um, it feels really important. And um, I, I believe the right people are going to hear because I'm going to, I'm going to say some things today I don't remember ever saying before. I can't say for sure I've ever said these things, but I don't remember it, teaching it exactly like this. So um, if we're ready, Charles, are we ready for the uh, podcast? Hmm? Oh, yeah, this is really cool. Uh, I guess it's okay to tell this. They, they weren't ready to make an announcement yet. Y'all remember Marshall Ruffin who came here for you know, all those years? Well, he and Corey had some real fertility challenges. I mean, it was, they needed a miracle to get pregnant. Well, they got pregnant, and and so I've been sort of keeping up with it. And, a f huh? Yes, we, we I counseled with them. We prayed over them. And I even went so far as to say, let's hope against hope, but... I was I, I did the whole thing about there's a sweet spot between not wanting it enough and wanting it too much, and you have to kind of find that place. And that was kind of hard for them to hear, but they received it. And I and anyway, bottom line is, uh, she texted me a while back and said, I don't know if Jonas told you this, but we're expecting uh, a boy in April. And I said, Okay, that's awesome. He's going to be born on my birthday, and he was. He was born. <laughs> And he's beautiful. I would show you a picture, but I don't, I don't know if they're ready to. His name is Solomon. And, um, and uh, he was born. Let, let me read you what, um, um, what he texted me. Um, oh, thank you, Freddie. I just saw, I just saw your gift. Um, let's see. Where was that? He says... Um, he says, Solomon Bird Ruffin was born on April 3rd uh, at 7.07 a.m., 7 pounds, 11 ounces, uh, and 20 inches in room 7. So he's very lucky. We're calling him Sonny. He couldn't share a birthday with a better dude. He and Corey are doing fine. Hope you all get to meet soon. Sending you and Ken all our love. And you, you can't see it, but that's him. And, um, yeah, he's, he's adorable. And... I said, oh, my God, dude, I'm totally crying. He's beautiful. I knew we were going to share a birthday. Congratulations. He said, of course you did. <laughs> and we appreciate you keeping the secret, which obviously I didn't. Uh, 
Thank you. We love you. Also, happy uh, belated birthday. So, yeah, that's really cool. Thanks for reminding me of that. Yeah. Um, lots, of, lots of miracles happening. Because, I mean, it was, they, they had to have a miracle. And they got one. They, they didn't do uh, IVF or any of that. It was, uh, it was like, it was a miracle. So, I mean, not that IVF isn't, but you know what I mean. So, uh, yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. Any other miracles? <laughs> okay. Now for ready. Welcome to the Metro Live podcast coming to you from the Atlanta Theater in the Kirkwood neighborhood of Atlanta. Metro people, would you please welcome the podcast people? Glad you're here. Wherever you are listening to this at whatever point in the future, uh, as always, we appreciate uh, Charles McFall for making these possible. Um, I am starting a new series today. Um, I believe that uh, I have people with an ear to hear and have an open heart, a belief for revelation, uh, and I speak into this atmosphere, let there be light. Uh, here's my title today. Uh, I'm calling it Medi- Meditation and manifestation, opening the hidden rooms of the heart to create a better reality. Um, Before I get into the um, uh, outline, um, let me give you a a context verse of Scripture that I haven't included in the outline, but it's important that you keep this in mind. In um, Matthew chapter 16, Jesus comes to his disciples and he says, who do, who, do you, who do men say that I am? I've taught on that ad infinitum. Um, they came up with different answers. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're this. Some say you're that. Uh, he didn't refute any of their perceptions. Uh, even when they implied reincarnation, he didn't, he didn't argue with that. He just said, well, who do you say that I am? And that's when Peter says, Oh, I say that you're uh, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, blessed are you, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And then it says, your name is, um, si- your name was Cephas, but now I'm Simon. Now I'm changing it to Peter, which is the Greek uh, uh, Petra. No, Petros. Uh, Petros is the uh, masculine. Now, the Roman Catholic Church believed in the masculine version of it and believed that the the church was literally built on Peter, that he was technically, isn't that right? Isn't that what you learned in Catholic school? Peter was technically the first pope. If you actually look at the the Greek, he what it says is your name is Petros, but upon this Petros, the feminine version, I will build my church and the gates of the unknown realm, King James translated, uh, which, by the way, I'm not recommending you watch this, but there's a series out about King James, because, you know, King James was gay. This is a really gay series about King James. It's out on stars. Like, wow, if that's accurate, he was gayer than I thought. Anyway, <laughs> I mean, we're watching it, and like, we're not even that gay. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was that, that King James, 1611, the, the authorized version. Uh, anywho, uh, and I'm not going to rec- I'm not going to tell you what it is because if you watch it, be like, "Whoa, Bishop, that's nasty." I'm like, "No, I didn't. I'm not telling you to watch it. It's apparently historically accurate. Don't shoot the messenger." Anyway, um, what the King James says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But it's actually it's the word Hades or the word unseen, which is a very uh, uh, very interesting concept for the divine feminine because he basically says you're a man but revelation is is feminine Re- Re- revelation uh is another it's another concept so basically what he's saying is he was in the context is the church will be built on the revelation of the christ not on peter 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 might have been the first person to have the petra but the church is not built on the Petros, okay? Y'all still with me? Um, now, it, the next thing he says is very interesting, and I've referred to it a lot. 
I've taught on it before. I kind of have taught it with on a different. Well, let me say it this way: Revelation is like throwing a pebble in a pond. There's ring after ring after ring after ring of revelation. So I can teach something from a verse of scripture. A year later, I can teach something else from that verse of scripture, and one doesn't negate the other. Do you understand? It's like um, I can like I. Uh, Interesting, Kevin, in my memories today, there was a review you had written of A Year in the Now. Well, A Year in the Now, does I mean, I wrote it in 2001. It doesn't even really sound like the way I taught now. However, and you know, Claudette, you were part of that miracle, Claudette. She, it was while, while I was thinking about writing a devotional, we were at an event. You remember this? And Claudette said, I don't know why I wanted to give you this. She gave me a calendar. It was a big, like, big desk calendar. And I went home that night, and I wrote all the titles in those, because it was, it was big enough for me to write in. It's not the kind of thing I would have normally bought, because that's, I didn't use desk calendars. But that was, I, I sat down that night and wrote 365 two-word titles from that. So she was, that was very, she was very prophetically instrumental. And people are still buying. How many copies did JT just buy for his? Uh, he, JT just bought 60 copies of them because he works with uh, uh, in recovery. And uh, I was telling Jared about it, and he said that kind, that kind of thing is great for recovery. Uh, it really works well. So I can read some things I wrote 23 years ago, and I think, boy, I've off since then. But it doesn't mean I'm saying burn all your copies of here and the now because there's some really good stuff in there i mean i think it's one of the reasons i was born it's uh i, I can't tell you the ministers over the years who have said i don't know what i'm preaching on anymore because i haven't read a year in the now i mean i of course none of them have ever tithed to me i don't know whatever that is about but uh more than one uh mega church pastor has told me i don't even I don't even have to study anymore. I just, I just, I just open a year in the now. You've got all the outlines, everything. I'm like, oh. Anyway, uh, so is that the way I talk now? No. Does it negate what I? No. It's like they're all, they're all rings in the, they're all the ripple effect or the other metaphor I use. It's different facets of the diamond. Okay, y'all still with me? And Jesus says this. Thing You know, once in a while, Jesus would just come out with something that was so startling and ahead of its time that we still haven't cracked the code on it. But he says, I say that you, uh, you are Petros, and on this Petra I will build my church. The gates of the unseen realm will not prevail against it. And I'm giving you the keys, plural, of the kingdom, and whatever you lock on earth will be locked in heaven. Whatever you unlock on earth will be uh, unlocked in heaven. And I think a couple of years ago I did a, uh, a teaching about uh, how that worked with relationships. And that was a really good teaching. Um, and when I've taught on the keys plural, I've used this in counseling a lot. When Sometimes when, when um, people have said to me, well, this is how I solved this problem before, but that doesn't seem to be working now. And I've said, well, just remember Jesus said, I'm, I'm giving you keys, plural. So it's kind of like having a, a key on a key, key ring and you're trying to open a door and you're like, that's not it, but it's on here somewhere. I know I've got that key. And so sometimes you have to keep going through the keys. I've never heard anybody else talk about that. But I think the fact that he didn't say, I'm giving you the key of the kingdom. He said, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. There's something, there's something compelling that, like, the swallows were turning to Capistrano every year. I'm, like, I always gravitate back to these certain verses, and they just intrigue me. And I, I want to keep teaching on them, and I think about them. And um, so, um, this, now, in the King James, in the gay King James, it says, uh, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth. But the, but the Greek actually says lock and unlock. When you think about keys, you think about locking something, unlocking something. So I don't think that's new. You've heard me talk about that before. So you're like, yeah, okay, what's, what's the unprecedented part? Well, 
another that I find magnetic is in Proverbs, and it's 20, verse 27. In the King James, it says, the, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching the innermost parts of the belly. Now, in Elizabethan English, belly was used, uh, they would use it referring to the inner man, the spirit man, the center of man. Uh, we would, in modern days, call it the subconscious or the heart. When we talk about the heart, we're not talking about the, the physical heart. We're talking about the... So, so belly's not talking about your digestive tract. It's talking about the, the center of you, okay? Um, now, let me show... Let's get to the outline. Let me show you... This is uh, Proverbs twenty twenty seven in the New King James, okay? The New King James... You know, the King James Version came out in... It was compiled in 1603. It was released in 1611. Um, it was not the first English translation, but it's definitely the most famous one. Even with the ex-president selling uh, Bibles, he, you know, he makes it a point to say it's the King James. No, no jokes. But I'm just saying that there are a lot of people that believe that is the authorized version. And it's not. It's just, it's just the most famous one. Which is why when I use other translations, I will tell you in King James, it says this, just as a reference point, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, in the New King James, I don't know what year it was, but uh, another set of scholars was put together, and they they kept the integrity of the original 17th century uh, translation, but just modernized the vernacular some. But uh, so it, I, I tend to use this New King James more than standard King James, and even. I'm probably giving you too much information. But even in the original 1611, if you've got one of those, most, if you'll notice, there's a lot of words that are italicized. And those italicized words are even those men in 1603 who were, they were saying, this is not a direct translation. This is, this is what we think this word meant. Why is that important? Because dogma, and fundamentalism comes from the letter that kills. And so that's why I love so many different translations, because I think somewhere between all of them, you get the gist of what was probably being said. But there's, let me tell you something, if you know anything, any of you that are multilingual, you know there's some things that just don't translate. They just don't. Um... Wellington, you're you're bilingual, aren't you? Yeah, like, not really. You, because <laughs> I I don't know. Like, co colonized uh, countries in Africa, many will maintain native dialects, and you're taught English in school. Isn't that right? But you don't you don't know that tribal language all that well. It's like, I'm American. I was watching Leave It to Beaver. I don't know. <laughs> Because your your native name is Fauna, right? Then they consider you to be gotcha. Yeah. But Wellington is your your British name, British name. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and I'm saying that because, like, I remember I've used this analogy before, but I remember years ago I'm preaching in the country of Panama, about five thousand people there. Um, I'm in the city of David. It's not far from Panama City. And um, I, they gave me a great translator. I mean, I liked this guy immediately. We were in the zone. He was like, I, I love when you're working with a translator that there's no, there's no error between your words and their words. Like they just, like it's, they're nearly anticipating what you're saying. And we had that rhythm going until I said, this guy was really cool. And the interpreter looked at me and he said, what do you mean? I said, and we're like on the stage. I said, you know, he was cool. He said, you mean like he was cold? Like he was, like he needed a jacket? I said, no, he, like I'm trying to explain. You know, he was like, like cool, dude. Like I, I, I didn't have a word for it. And and somebody else that was bilingual was like, they were going, Shabade, Shabade. And like that apparently was nearly the Spanish equivalent. But I could tell 
He just had no, we just hit a, a roadblock. There was no direct translation for it because cool is not just a word, it's concept. Cool, is, it's amazing. I mean, back in the 40s, guys that were wearing zoot suits were saying, cool, man, cool. And then in the 50s, the beatniks were, oh, that's really cool. In the 60s, the hippies were talking about cool. Used to, all these other words have come and gone. Cool has remained. My kids say cool. Oh, that's really cool. So cool is there's cool's in a whole other uh, category by itself, but you can't translate it into Spanish. And that's important because when people get too dogmatic about it is written, I want to say, well, yeah, it is written, but then it was translated and retranslated and retranslated. So. Yeah, it's written, but you're not reading what originally was written. And even what was written came through human understanding. Y'all all know this. I assume people should know this. When I read my feed on Facebook, I'm amazed at how many people don't know this. So, in the New King James, he says, the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. In 1611, they said candle. The spirit of a man, nice touch there. I see what you did. I see what you did, Michelle. You got a candle and a lamp. Yes, you did. That's pretty good. Let's give it up for Michelle. That's pretty good. That's pretty good special effects. She's cool. <laughs> the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. And in the King James, there's a little note that says literally, it means rooms, plural, of the belly. Now, when I connect Matthew 16, 19 with Proverbs 20, 27, what I'm hearing is the belly has many rooms, the kingdom has many kings. Y'all with me? Now let me tell you where I'm going with it in just a minute, but let me show you. Here is Proverbs 20, 27 in the Young's literal translation. It says, now, every time I lead, I think every time I lead you in a meditation, I nearly every time will say, breath in the scriptures, breath and spirit, spirit and breath are interchangeable. I say it all the time. Old Testament Hebrew is ruach. New Testament, Greek is pneuma, spirit and breath, breath and spirit. That's why I believe meditation is so spiritual. When Danny and I had the conversation a few years back, he said, he said, I'm not arguing with you. I just want to know where you're going with this. Has meditation replaced prayer? I said, no, it hasn't replaced prayer. It's just, in my mind, the difference is, Instead of seeking something outside yourself, meditation says, let me go within and find out that the word's already written on my heart. Like the, the, I take it quite literally when Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. So, interestingly, Young's says, the King James says, the, the spirit of man. Here he says, the breath of a man is a lamp of Jehovah searching all the inner parts, plural, of the heart. Rooms of the belly, parts of the heart, keys of the kingdom. You seeing a pattern here? Um, breath and spirit. Now, um, like, um, I don't know, in the Assemblies of God, you may have heard this. I used to hear this all the time. Even my dad would use it sometimes when, when they'd give an altar call, come down to the altar and get saved or receive Jesus. Um, there would be a threat in there. And I'm not blaming my dad. That's, where, that's the cloth he was cut from. That They would say, God says my spirit will not always strive with man. And there would, some of you on the Baptist church might have heard that. And it was... It was like a, nearly like a threat, meaning if you don't come tonight, there might not be another chance for you. 
because it, like the spirit. Have y'all heard that? Whatever church you grew up, it, so there was a there was like an ultimatum. Like you better come now because my spirit will not always strive. Now the because the implication was, if you're feeling the pull toward the altar, you better act on it now because God might give up on you at some point. That that's what was implied. If you go back to Genesis six and read it in here's a concept context. It's after the flood, and um, it's Noah and his family leave the ark, and uh, God, he's basically saying, um, man's not going to live on the earth forever. And he doesn't say, my spirit not always strive with him. He says, my breath will not always be in him. But I'm going to give him about 120 years. That's where that came from. Most people, when they look for a biblical lifespan, they go to Psalm 90, uh, three score and ten years. I'm only four years away from that one, so I'm like, we got, I'm, I'm a Genesis 6 man. <laughs> 70, 70 is a little too close. Some of you are already, so what are y'all still doing here? Y'all already post 70. <laughs> I remember years ago when I used to listen to Kenneth Copeland, he, I remember him sit, saying, my dad just turned 70, and I told him, Dad, the Bible says you've got three score and ten years, so if you're ready to go on, you can go now. Uh, but he was like in his 40s when he said it. However old he is now, I'm sure he ain't saying it now. <laughs> Change, big time. So I'm going for 120, and even my 120 is with a caution. It's like, as long as I can still kind of be like this, if I'm in a vegetative state, no, I don't want 120 years of, of <laughs> being plugged into something. Because uh, for years I've said, I'm going to live my 120. I thought, I better not keep saying that or my kids are going to be like looking at me slumped over catatonic going, dear God, how many more years does he have? We're nowhere near 120. We're going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so now I have amended it, saying 120 as long as I can, as long as I know who I am and can kind of take care of myself. And you can remember that. Uh, <laughs> I don't want you to be so like, dear Lord, how many years are you stuck with? I don't know. He spoke 120 into existence. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, uh, but as far as everything looks now, I'm still going for the 120. My point is, when he says, my, King James says, my spirit will not always strive, he was saying, you're not going to live on the earth forever. My breath will not be in people forever. That misquoted verse scared a lot of people to altars over the years. And that's not at all what he was saying. In fact, Paul comes along and says, nothing can separate us from his love. Like, God, God would never give up on so, um, the third one I want to show you, this is Proverbs 20, 22 in the concordant literal version. Here he also uses breath instead of spirit. A lamp of Yahweh is the life breath of mankind, searching all the chambers, plural, of the inner being, okay? Now, before I get into some of these quotes, let me, let me explain to you why I'm going here. Um, and the reason I'm talking about meditation and manifestation. Um, Dr. Joe Dispenza says the universe doesn't respond to what we want as much as it responds to who we are being. So where I'm going with this, and not just for today, but for this whole month, and especially for those of you who are going to St. Simon's, I want you to get in this line of thinking that um, you want to go inward to find your solutions. Your, uh, I, I think I'm going to end up in Psalm 51 where um, David said, you desire truth in the inward parts. Parts, plural. Um, 
I want us to get to the place where we can open, where we can take the keys of the kingdom and open up the rooms of our heart to manifest on the outside what is reality on the inside. Okay. Now, the clincher is not everything on the inside needs to be manifested on the outside. I was thinking about this this week. I don't even remember what triggered it. Um, I had an excellent week. Wednesday had a beautiful birthday. Ken got off from work early, and we went to Houston's, and it was great. And then uh, I got lots of people wrote beautiful things, which I really appreciated. And many people sent me gifts, and that was wonderful, financial gifts. Um, that night, Jared's band, the Black Lips, opened for the Black Crows, and it was um, I, you probably have some pictures of it, I guess. Um, that was, before before we got there, that was up on the stage of the Fox. He was taking us back stage to uh, do a tour. And uh, there he is. And, and uh, it was like a real dream of his to play at the Fox. That's us before <laughs> Happiness Bastards is the name of, was the name of, I, I just decided to embrace it. I'm like, I guess I'm a happiness bastard. Uh and uh, then Judah got there a little bit later, and and uh, uh, that was in the um, uh, dressing room. Uh, that's some of the people in uh, Jared's band. That's his friend Max. That guy is from Mastodon. He's like, um, I forgot his name, but he's like a heavy metal icon. And uh, uh, so we had, it was, it, it was a perfect ending to a great birthday. And uh, I'm, I'm very blessed. And, and then when I got home, yeah, that was from the Atlanta Journal. Uh, George Sandler sent me that. And it was, it was a great concert. And, uh, yeah, that's him on the stage. Uh, yeah, there's some cool shots. It was, it was, it was very, very cool. And um, uh, there was a guy sitting behind us, and he said, he said, are, are you related to one of those guys on the stage? And I said, yeah, it's my son. And he, like, they thought that was so amazing. And Jerry came out and met him. And it was just, it was just great. And, th- and then when I got home, uh, Christina FaceTimed me with the girls. And I had plenty of time. We probably sat there and talked for an hour. I don't think you have those pictures. But uh, we talked. For, oh, we did? Oh, yeah, that was the girls. Oh, that's me down in the <laughs> corner. That's Clementine. And... Uh, we just, yeah, she's she's big now. That's Christina's. She's become a celebrity um, DJ, but she's also reopening her store in Santa Fe. She just uh, she just uh, that's Clementine showed me her pig, and uh, uh, so it was great. They've moved into a, a big house and they love it. And the girls are doing great in school. And uh, Sophia's a, a junior in uh, high school, and she may be coming. She might be going to Agnes Scott and. Uh, next year, so that would be great to have her here. And so it was like that was. I, I mean, I'm I, like by the end of the evening, I'm I'm in total bliss. It's like this is great. Jonah's not here. He's he has a uh, he and a, I guess you call it a group. He and a, another guy who's a rapper. They they call it Revival Season. And he's in he's in uh, L.A. right now. They he and Sophie just closed on a house in East Point. Beautiful little house. And uh, Sophie's flying out there. She may already be there because Jared's house sitting for them. And um, they're going to drive drive back from L.A. and then move into their new house. So it's like, like I'm sitting there on my birthday thinking, you know, all, all is well. And, you know, we're. I cannot say it's been totally easy uh, getting mom situated into assisted living but she's been there for a week and at least she's she's there and you know we've had some <laughs> yesterday we went over there because i i sold her car because she's not driving anymore so i was meeting carvana over there because she had to be present for the sale and um uh while we were sitting there she was telling me that uh uh and if she i don't know if she's watching but don't be mad that I'm saying this. Uh, she said that, I mean, it's taken her a while to integrate with the other people. Like, she takes her meals in her room. And I said, why don't you go out and sit with the people? And she said, well, they're all so old. I said, I know, but they're your, 
They're your age. You're older than some of them. She doesn't think of herself that way. And um, so instead of us going tonight, I said, I'm going to come Monday night, and I'm going to have dinner with you out at the place so to help you. Because she's, you know, it's new for her just to meet people as her. She's used to being the pastor's wife going in in that mode. It's just, it's, it's different. And um, so I'm trying to cut her some slack, but she hasn't been the happiest camper, <laughs> to put it mildly. And, uh, you know, the, at this point, the cardiologist isn't even lecturing me about stress anymore. He's just like, I don't know what else to tell you. Just, you know, <laughs> like, we're going to have to figure out something. And, um, you know, while he's doing it, in the middle of your text, mom's, you know, complaining to me about things. And I'm like, <laughs> get it down, get it down, get it down. And... Um, any of you that have had blood pressure issues, you know what it's like where you're like, I mean, I didn't eat for 24 hours before I didn't have coffee. I'm thinking Zen thoughts, and it's still that. Anyway, um, uh, we're sitting there, I don't know if it was before or after the car guy got there, but mom said that. Uh, she says, Maddie, that works in the front office, she came and got me. They had an a cappella group that was singing. She says, it's the most beautiful music I've ever heard in my life. And I'm like, you said something. You said something positive. And, uh, and then she's, I said, did you have your lunch already? She said, yeah, they brought me lunch. It was the best vanilla ice cream I've ever had for dessert. I said, oh, my God, there's two positive things in a row. She said, what are you talking about? I said, I'm just so happy to hear you say something positive. She said, do I complain that much? I said, Non-stop. I mean, like, that, like constantly. You complained when you were in the house, and so I got you a place that checks all the boxes of everything you were complaining about. There, you're still complaining, and uh, you know it's a little overwhelming. And she said, "Am I a terrible person?" I said, "No, I just don't think you realize." She said, "I just think we're chatting." I said, "No, that's not chatting. <laughs> that's. I'm just. I'm just so happy to hear there was something you liked." Baby steps, but something you like. And um, so th there's a lot going on uh, in my life. Uh, I don't want to say even good and bad. It's just a lot going on. It's, it's just life. Uh, Jackie was catching me up on because they've, they've had some drama recently. And, and it was kind of like they've been around the block enough times. They're like, well, what do we? It's like, you, you know, at a certain point, you don't panic about stuff anymore because you're like, well, all right, what do we got to do, you know? And <laughs> it's just, I don't know. That's one of the things that's so, supposed to happen when you age is you just don't freak out so much. It doesn't mean things aren't stressful and difficult, but it's like, well, what do we got to do? Who do we have to call? What do we, you know, what do we need to change? You, you just become uh, a problem solver and you become more proactive. At least you should. Because I'll tell you this, in life, you're either a problem solver or you're a problem. I mean, that's basically it. I mean, it's just true. It's a, you either. But is, don't, don't you know what I'm talking about? And, and there are people that fall into one or two categories. Um, I, you know, I've learned to be a problem solver. And sometimes I get overwhelmed with it. But, I'm, you know, I'm used to taking care of things. I never, my children are all adults. I don't think any of them have ever even asked me for money. or like they, They're all self-sufficient. But I never leave any of the, even on Wednesday nights when I meet with my boys, the last thing I say to them is, y'all need anything. I mean, that's, that's just, I don't know how not to say that. Because if they needed something, I would, you know, I'd figure, I'd say it to Christina. She says, oh, I need so much. I said, well, anything I can do. She says, no, actually, I'm good. I said, well, if there's something I could do, let me know. And, and you know, I said, J just so you know, you've convinced me you're kind of superwoman. I said, I don't really 
worry about you because I've seen you go through marriages and divorces and pregnancies and, you know, move into another place. I mean, you, I'm kind of just always assume you're going to rise to the top. And she does. And um, she just told, she's DJing some celebrity wedding coming up. And I didn't even know who either of these, I, I Googled them and they both have Wikipedia pages. They both, my, my sons all knew who they were. And with what they're paying her to DJ, I'm like, I need to find out how to DJ. I had no idea they pulled in that kind of money. I could do, I could do that. <laughs> so, uh, I'm saying all that to say um, upheaval is not the word, but um, turbulence in my life stimulates revelation. So anytime there's a little bit of a shaking in my world, it shakes revelation loose. Um, so I'm driving in my car on Thursday and I just hear the voice in me say the spirit of a man, the spirit of a woman, the breath of a man, the breath of a woman, the meditation of a man, the meditation of a woman is the candle, the light, the lamp of the heart searching all the hidden rooms of the belly, the hidden rooms of the heart, the inner chambers of the subconscious. Now, you don't have to give me a show of hands, but how many of you can relate to, you can think about things from your childhood that are wonderful, great, beautiful memories, I, I don't know, so things show up in my feed, like there was something in my feed this week that's about uh, like toys from the 60s, and there was a picture of the original, remember, any of you remember the original Spirograph? They finally took them away because they had those little pins in them and they were kind of dangerous, but oh, I just thought Spirograph was the coolest thing. I loved, you know, taking the pin and making like, that is so, I just, I could do that for hours, and I loved Etch-A-Sketch, I thought that was so cool. And, you know, when somebody brings up something that you have a, a, a conscious re relation to, it triggers a lot of, po you know, it releases dopamine. It's like a lot of positive things. And it, got, it just got me thinking about, oh, I remember that. And you know how in neuropaths in your brain, one thing's connected to something else. So I'm thinking of all these funny things and, and thinking about cartoons I would watch. And there's, there's certain things about childhood that are just, Blissful, just bliss. I, I can think about it and, and just nearly feel as uh, elated. It's like my inner child is just as elated about it as it was then. I totally get that feeling again. Sometimes there'll be, like when Christmas comes, there'll be something, there'll be a smell or a taste or a song, and it triggers like the excitement of Christmas and, you know, the way you viewed Christmas as a child. And, and I love that. I love sharing those things, uh, you know, with people and, and the people of my age group. And, you know, it's, it's an immediately a bonding thing. Like, I, like um, yesterday, b before we went to meet the car guy, I had to do a bunch of stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I got up to turn the TV. He was making some breakfast. And, and I was thinking, uh, kids today have no idea what Saturday used to be. Because Saturday, when you, when you wake up, it's not only you don't have to go to school, but like kids who grew up with cable TV and 24-hour television have no idea what a big deal Saturday morning cartoons were and staying in your pajamas and eating cereal and, and all you knew all your lineup of cartoon like for me there was I, mean, I I didn't have to worry about being an early riser I mean like as soon as they came on I was wanting to like oh I love all that stuff and you know as, as, as the day went on it would you know it would be like American Bandstand and
thing, and then they'd show a Tarzan movie, and and it's like, you know, just that, that just that just like, oh my God, that's the most exciting thing in the world. Even um, I was listening to a podcast this week about the guy who made in in 1985 they did a sequel to The Wizard of Oz called Return to Oz. And a lot of people didn't like it because they said it was too dark. And he said, the thing is, I was raised on the Oz books. I never saw the 1939 uh, movie until I was 12. So he said, those books were dark. They were scary. They, they were supposed to tap into the scary way that children, you know, see things. And so I went back and I, I watched a little bit of the movie. And it was, it was kind of bleak you know I lost I kind of lost interest about 20 minutes into it but it was interesting to hear his take on it and it kind of has its own cult following now uh I mean it is what it is but um now like my kids can watch the night I know how much you love the the night you the 1939 version kids can watch now and they can like it but when I was growing up it was a whole thing to it because it only came on once a year and it was an event and it came on Sunday nights, and and I never could watch it because we were always at church on Sunday nights, and uh, and all the good stuff came on Sunday night. I, I, once in a while, I could stay with my grandmother and watch the wonderful world of Disney when Tinkerbell would fly out there, and the, the world is a carousel of color, color, beautiful. I'd be like, oh, I hate church, I hate church, I hate church. <laughs> I gotta go to church. Oh, victory. Jesus, I want to go. And then the, the Charlie Brown stuff always came out on Wednesday night. Wednesday night Bible study. Next next day at school, everybody says, did you watch Charlie Brown? No. I was at YPE listening to people's, you know, devil's been after me all week. I hate church. But my point is, see, that's coming out of a different room, and that's where I'm, this is where I'm going with it. Because there's one room in your subconscious where all these wonderful, beautiful, happy memories, and you haven't, you haven't uh, embellished them. They really were that wonderful. And the, the, the childhood emotion attached to it is still in there, and it's still real. That's why you can take a key and open that one room, and it's like, oh, childhood was so wonderful. Wonderful. There may be another room. It's got some scary stuff in there. There's some monsters in that room. The boogeyman's in that room. Dragons. Fears, the memories of being called names on the playground, rejection. For some people, there's abuse, there's verbal abuse, there's physical abuse, there's sexual abuse. How can both things be true? Because they're in separate rooms. Um. Jackie and I were talking about that it's okay to say y'all are moving. Uh, there, she's lived in her house since 1940, and y'all been married. I mean, not that for 40 years, not since 1940, and y'all been married tw- 20 years, right? So half of the time you've been there. Jackie's also been there, so they re- they united. So she was just saying, it's a lot. When you think about, it. and I said, listen, one of the greatest blessings to me right now is, I mean, I may have to sell my mom's house eventually because where she is, it's expensive. Uh, Right now, we can do it. Uh, We'll we'll see how things work out. But I'm just so happy I don't have to deal with taking that house apart right now because there's a lot. You've been over there. It's a lot of stuff. I mean, I was in there yesterday, and I'm walking around thinking, oh, Lord. What am I going to do? And I, we ain't even talking about the basement. Oh, Lord. All of my books are down there. Uh, I mean, like, if I thought I had to deal with all that right now, I'd be in assisted living. 
I'd be taking, I'd be taking a room next door to mom's. <laughs> uh, because movies a lot in every room. It's like, well, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. And here, here's where I'm going with this, with the meditation part. And I've kind of, no, I haven't changed my thought on this. My, my thoughts on this have evolved. Let me say this. I believe in forgiveness. I believe in therapy when, when it's needed, needed and helpful. I do think time heals a lot of things. I do think at some point you just, there's a statute of limitations on bad memories and, you know, you know it is what it is. Um, I think you have different perspectives of things as you get older. Um, I don't think you have to stay in, if you had a traumatic childhood, I don't think you have to stay in trauma mode all the time. I think you can move past certain things. I don't believe, however, that it's, the, the subconscious is just one big room. I think there's something. Whatever you lock is locked. Whatever you unlock is unlocked. I think there's something that you're ready to let go. As recently as about an hour ago, we got out of the car. Rhonda had a spot reserved for us in BJ's absence. A guy is walking down the street with a German Shepherd. And Ken says, oh, it's a beautiful German Shepherd. I looked at him, and he looks exactly like Sam, the dog that my parents gave away when I was nine. Now, that was one of the hardest things I ever went through in my entire life. And I'm still not totally, that room's not empty yet. Uh, I've moved a lot of stuff out of there. I've opened the key over the years and say, you know, my parent, my dad's gone. Mom doesn't even remember it. I'm not even mad at anybody about it. And even when you said it today, I didn't say I didn't, didn't even say anything. You, if that had been two or three years ago, I would have said, oh wow, that dog looks just like Sam, and it would have, it wouldn't have shut me down, but I would have had a few minutes of having to process it. Today, I was just like, well, that's you know, German Shepherd. It's like it wasn't so. That room is nearly cleaned out. Are you following my metaphor? Um, the same way I wouldn't want somebody breathing down my neck telling me, get out of the, get, your, get your mom's house cleaned out. I, I could not handle that stress right now. I don't want any of my body in my life saying, get over your, your nonsense from childhood. Do you know what I mean? I've ta- I'm doing the work. I've... Gone, I've taken the key of the kingdom and gone into that. And like we've gotten a lot, there's a lot of pain that's gone from there. It is what it is. There's even, I guess, some understanding of why they did it. Because I know the real reason. Because uh, a, a thing happened with my dad where the dog tried to protect me. And I saw in my dad's eyes, I thought he's going to. He's going to get rid of this dog. And he did. Now, he was a young man. Uh, I'm not blaming him. He's on the other side now. I'm saying, if somebody just says to me, oh, get over yourself. You had a, you were an only child. You were privileged. You had a, I, I don't, I don't need that. Because you weren't there. You don't know what I had to do to cope with that. Because when it happened, I was told, don't cry, be a big boy, this is what we've got to do. And the only way I could handle it, because it was was so overwhelming to me, I remember just going inside and just having to, the part of my heart that loved dogs, I just had to kill it. That's the only way I could do it. I was just like, ah, dogs are dead to me. And they've been for the rest of my life. Like, I'm not cruel to dogs, but... You, when a dog comes up, like except that there's a few people in my building that've got a dog on the. That I've gotten to where, uh, you know, their little dog will jump up on me. They're like, "I'm sorry, but no, they're fine. She's fine." I mean, there's two or three of them I have a little rapport with, and it's 
it's cool. It's not, it's, it's nothing bad. I'm like, I don't hate dogs. But I also have had to figure out how do I get that back? Because I remember, you may relate to this, not with dogs, but it might be something else in a relationship or something where you, the only survival technique you had was just to kill a part of your heart. This is like, I don't know, this is too painful. I'm just going to have to deaden this or cut this part of my heart out. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel sorry for me. You've got stories just as painful, probably. Did I have a bad childhood? Hell no. I had one do- That same man that gave my dog away bought me this awesome thing that was my favorite childhood. It, I called it a tree house, but it was. It was called a ranger station. I remember he bought it at Western Auto, and it had, it, it was like the stuff that like uh, swing sets are made out of, but it had four poles, and it had a ladder that you climbed up. There's a little platform. There's a little canvas top to it, and it had a pole that you slid down, and it was like, you know, the most one, at, my, at his funeral, I said, I want to thank my dad for building me the ranger station, because it was, it was like one of my happiest Memories. So, was my dad a bad guy? No. Did he do some things that hurt me badly? Yes. I probably did some things to my children that hurt them badly. I, I go yesterday after we left mom's. There's a a golden corral close there. We like to go there. It's way too crowded in there, but there's a lot of. But we that's where we go. And uh, Ken was over there getting his plate, and I. I texted Jared because we had seen, we, we went by the house to get mom's car. Jared was out there. He's leaving for Spain, but he was out there mowing her lawn. And he said, I've, I've hired somebody to take care of the lawn while I'm gone. I said, you don't have to do that. I'll take care of it. He said, no, I want to do it. And I said, okay, great. And um, so I texted Jared. I said, call me. It's not urgent, but call me when you get a minute. So I told him the thing about mom liking two different things. And, I, and he said, that is such a praise report because he knows because he's, you know, lived with her for two years. And um, I said, you know, when you're an adult, you want to say parents shouldn't be able to trigger you like this, but that's easier said than done. I said, I'm sure I trigger you, and I'm sure your mother triggers you. I mean, th- with my kids, I'm like, whatever it is, just tell me, and let's work it out. Let me tell you what happens when you tell your kids that. Sometimes they tell you. I haven't had it with Judah and Jonah, but Jared and Christina both have told me. A few years back, Jared told me, to, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was bad. And so I texted Christina. I said, you're not going to believe what you, and Christina's was worse than Jared's. I'm like, good God, how long have y'all felt this way? It, it was stuff they were told in childhood that was not true that I'm like, I'm glad it came to the surface. That's not, that never happened. That, I never said that, but I'm. <laughs> I'm, I'm like in a, a Starbucks reading their text going, oh, my God. I mean, I'm just like sitting on the floor. I'm thinking, buddy, one thing I am, I'm dad of the year. I'm dad of this. No better dad than me. And I'm like, ooh, snap. That's a, I guess I haven't been. And some of their points were well taken. I'm like, oh, fair enough. You're right. That, that, yeah, that probably, is the, that probably is what happened. And I'm glad I was raised in a generation where I can communicate. My men that came out of my dad's generation, they weren't raised that way. You didn't question authority. You didn't, they didn't talk about stuff. You didn't talk things out. There was no such a thing as an apology, which a simple apology would have fixed it. I could look at my kids and go, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. I, I shouldn't have acted. I, I totally overreacted to that, and that, that that's on me. And, and that's why we're all, as far as I know, we're all good friends. I've been meeting with my sons every Wednesday night for two years, and I always say, is there anything, because we talk about a lot of stuff, y'all got any issues with me, we need to clear the air. Because I ain't getting any younger, and I don't want to be like, you know, checking out of here, and they go, oh, yeah, we forgot to tell you, we're mad at you. But I'm like, no, let's, let's get it out on the table now. Well, actually, I take it back, Jer- Judah did have a thing with me. I forgot, yeah. Because I was saying some stuff about when he started his church. And when he called me on it, I said, you know what? You're right. I wasn't thinking you would think any of that was about you. It's because 
there were people that had had bad vibes to me were going to his church, and I took it personally. I don't even think most of them are even there now, so it's, it's a moot point. But I said, I can see why you hearing me say that, that I, I should not have said that. You're exactly right, and I, I can't believe it took you this long to, to confront me about it. I mean, I want to have that kind of. Do you, do you see where I'm going with this? All right. I don't want to try to get all this said today. Let me finish because there, there's a lot here. But you get, the, you get what I'm talking about. You, you're not just going to fix everything in your life at once. There's a lot of rooms in there. And you know how it is if you're planning on moving, you work in a, you know, let's, let's get some work. Let's, let's clean out that garage. Let's do this, whatever. But, but that's all you can do today. You know what I mean? Y'all feel me? And thank God there are doors that close. You're like, we're not finished with this room yet. We're still packing up some things. There's still some things under construction. The spirit, the breath of man is the candle of the Lord. The idea is, how do I breathe in a way that opens up things I want to manifest? Let me show you these, um, the rest of this, and I'm going to put a comma here for today. Uh, Earl Nightingale says this, uh, whatever we plant in our subconscious mind and nourished with repetition and emotion will one day become a reality. I believe that. And I think if you keep opening a bad room, an unhealed room, an infected room, uh, you, keep, you keep recreating negative stuff. You keep going around Sinai. You hear what I'm saying? And it's because something stinks in that room. And when you open that door, it starts stinking up the outside world. Next thing, uh, John Osaroff says this. Most people are thinking about what they don't want, and they're wondering why it shows up over and over again. Hear what I'm saying? It's because everything's coming out of this one room that right now you might not be able to deal with. Whatever you lock is locked. Whatever you unlock is unlocked. Some things you're like, I'm not there yet. Click. Let me open up this room because this room is, and it's not, listen, it's not denial. The idea is you'll get to all of them eventually. Next thing, this Ravi Shankar says, uh, whatever you put attention to will start manifesting in your life. Intention, attention, manifestation, that is how the universe works. Where is it coming from? Am I attracting it or am I manifesting it? Yes, you're doing both. And it's like the, it's like the cycle of precipitation. It's like the, the earth... Uh, has a vapor that comes up that turns into clouds and the clouds rain and you know it's like it's it's a cycle and then finally this is a very familiar verse of scripture this is uh proverbs 19 i said 51 but i meant 19 this is verse 12 and 13 in the amplified classic 51 is where he's um repenting about bathsheba and he says search me and see if there's any uh wicked way in me here he says who can discern, this is in the Amplified Classic, who can discern his lapses and errors? Clear me from hidden and unconscious faults. Have you ever met somebody that they're so toxic, you think, Where, why are you so toxic? Because they're operating out of this one, they've unlocked something, and it's out of the abundance of that room, the heart is speaking. Um, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. In other words, there's some things I know, I know why I did that. There's other things, like somebody cut me off in traffic and I was trying to find a way to kill him. Like, what is that about? Why did I, why wasn't I just aggravated? Why was I plotting a murder? Like, what is that? Like, what? I mean, if I've got rage issues, Why? Because let me tell you something, if you don't ask that question, that rage 
could land you in jail one day. Um, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent and clear of great transgression. In other words, I'm going to get to cleaning out the whole house. But I have the keys of the kingdom. And some things I got, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to unlock them completely. And if I do unlock them, it may just be to go in there and do a little work. But I'm not going to get all that cleaned out today. But I'm getting there. Does that resonate with you? Are there some things in your life that are like, yeah, they're, they're kind of healed. And, and sometimes you have little touchstones. Seeing that German Shepherd today, that's like, it didn't, it didn't mess with my head. I was like, yeah, that, that, that. I just look at it. That's a pretty German Shepherd with a black face. I, did, I didn't even think initially, oh, wow, that looked like Sam. I just thought, that's, yeah, there's lots of, that's what most German Shepherds look like. It's not that rare. Which means the room's about ready to be permanently unlocked. And I can move on to other things. Because I'm not, you know, I'm not totally there yet. But man, we're, I can walk down the corridors of my subconscious and we're, I mean, sweet Jesus in the morning. In 2010, I opened the biggest one (laughs) and survived it. The rest of it, I mean, it, that was like a grand atrium hallway. It, like, it was like a ballroom. It was, it, you know, if we got that one taken care of, the rest of these other little little bedrooms and whatever, I, I can get to those. The main one, already, it's, not only, uh, it's not only opened up, it's ready for showing. Like bring the, you know, bring the photographer from House and Garden, come in and check, like, that room's fantastic all right i have a lot more to say about it this month but we've said a lot today comma let's all stand Hmm? oh i wasn't gonna do meditation but see i said if i didn't talk too long and guess what i did i talked too long but it's there's a lot of information and i had to i had to get it all to you We will meditate. Um, Ideally, I'll get all this said, and when we get to the beach on St. Simon's, something very powerful is going to happen because kingdom keys are being used. We have this Petra, this revelation knowledge. Um, I'm a heart healer. I was called to, people don't tell me you preached a good sermon. They tell me, oh my God, that mess. I'm, I guarantee you today people will message me and say, that, w- that changed my life today. No one will say you preached a good sermon because I didn't preach. I still don't know what it is I do. Y'all don't even know. If somebody says, what is it? Is he a good preacher? Like, no, we've never figured it out. What exactly? Is he a teacher? Mm, I mean, kind of, but it's a what is it? I don't know. We never know what it is. <laughs> and I, you know what? I don't even know if I want to put a label on it. Like, come to Metron and I'll do that thing that I don't know what it is that I do. And and you're a seeker, which is why you're interested in it. And some people aren't interested in seeking anything. They just want to say, just tell me what I believe, and I'll never challenge it, and that's I'll, I'll live my life that way. And that's fine. If you want to do that, that's fine. I can't live that way. I want to, I want to for whatever time I have left, I want to enjoy it at all. I don't want to just, I want to go from glory to glory, not from trigger to trigger. I know, I'm, I'm me malicious today. <laughs> None of these are premeditated. I'm just a surprise. Concert. 
<laughs> right. That probably has something to do with it, too. Um, yeah, it actually did. B being at the Fox, you know, I've got a lot of emotion connected with the Fox. and Being there, and Jared was like, you could see in the pic, I talked to Howie, he said, I've never seen Jared look so happy. I said, it was like a really happy night. It was like, because I, I was really proud of him. Because that's in my, played at the Fox Theater, that's in my Metron. Do you know what I mean? If he was a great football player, I'd be like, yeah, I mean, I'd be cheering for him, but I couldn't relate to it. That I can relate to. Like, when I said to him, I am so proud of you, he knew I meant it. Because I'm like, this is, this is so cool that you got to do this. So, um, let's freeze it right there until we talk again. Uh, I speak uh, protection over your heart and all the rooms in it. And I decree that profound change and growth is going to happen in the month of April. We will remember this month and we will see it as a turning point on many levels. Selah, please remain standing. Play the outro, if you will, maestro. Contributing to Metron is quick and easy. You can give anytime using any smartphone. Text the amount you'd like to donate to 404-620-5044. You will then receive a notification that you successfully completed your donation. You may also visit visionthenow.com and click the support tab to give there as well. When you contribute to Metron, you're also donating to the charity or organization of the month. Thank you for your investment into Metron. Did you get anything out of this today? If you have a check, make it to JESM. If you have cash, just pay it forward. Be a blessing to somebody. And we'll be back here next week to see where spirit takes us. What? I love the term lock and unlock better than losing and buying it. Oh, yeah. it. It makes sense, especially with keys. Because loosing and binding, to me, thinks of rope. Keys is with locking and unlocking, yeah. And which is why, if you just stay with the 611 vernacular, you're not going to hear what Jesus was talking about. He was, about. he was talking about keys and locks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I thought about, and some of you women as well, when you clean in your house, I don't know if y'all do this, I can be in a room cleaning and I think of something in the other room <laughs> and I stop. But today, one room at a time, one room at a time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop. What you do when you go to the other room? Yeah, that's it. One room at a time. But sometimes you do have to say, I'll, I'll get back to this. And I'm going to lock it because nobody needs to be in there till I get this like it needs to be. But yes. Yes. Absolutely. Anybody else? Okay. I think uh, for today, mission accomplished. Go in peace. I love you. <laughs>